there, virtual sim lifers? Thanks for clicking, and I hope you brought your swimming gear, because today's expedition is a wet one. Trustworthy and I are jumping into yet another Axodal produced game, and this time it's Raft. We haven't at all given up on Scrap Mechanic, but we do like to mix up our game selection, so we trusted that this would be fun. And that trust was not misplaced. This video is all about getting familiar with the first stages before one even gets to the storyline progress. Currently, the game features two chapters, and I'll probably get around to all of them because I'm really enjoying this game so far. There are scrap mechanic videos in the works too, saved on the editor files for the future. We've got several options on the play mode here. A recent update added a creative mode with the ability to craft in open water with no trash or islands in sight. More traditionally, the story mode comes in several flavors of easy, medium, hard, and peaceful, which means none of the animals are hostile. You're free to float without interference, and not even island animals will attack. The big difference between the other game modes are things like losing inventory on death, more frequent and more difficult shark attacks, or demands to deal with survival needs. Raft is an interesting premise with spending the bulk of your time on a constantly moving pile of scrap that you can slowly construct into a bigger and bigger home base. You'll need to, because unlike many traditional gathering crafting simulators, there is no landmass to set up your farm on. It's all going to be right here on the waves. Thank goodness for the motion sickness setting. But it is perhaps this that's brought the game plenty of popularity because it presents a new challenge, but still with familiar sandbox aspects. Sort of like how Five Nights at Freddy's took off despite its simplicity, sticking players in their security guard post without the ability to move, but still created a frantic and frightening situation. There's plenty of moving and gathering to do in Wrath, but you're also never far from it. Everything in your game and life revolves around it, as if the raft is almost like part of the player. Instead of having shiny gear to show off your achievements, how outfitted and swanky your raft is might say something about how hard you've adventured. Players start out with a hook attached to a rope on four planks of raft. This allows one to at least haul in some garbage from around the raft or grab it by hand if it's floating by close enough. The basics are wood planks, palm scraps, plastic bottles and pieces. Sprinkled throughout will be barrels and boxes that are grab bags with all of the above plus scrap metal, stone, and foods. So look out for those and grab as many as you possibly can. Tab opens the crafting menus and your inventory bag. The crafting sidebar has categories from food, farming and production, to tools or furniture. To expand on this menu, craft a research table once your raft is large enough to support it. Here you can use loot that you're fishing up to research for the recipes that you're going to need. After hitting the learn button on the bench, it will now be craftable from the tab menu along with everything else. But there are two items we should make before getting to that table, and those are to sustain life. A purifier for that thirst meter and a grill for the hunger. Along with the purifier, a cup is needed because once the little palm and stick stand setup is built, you'll take the cup and fill it with salt water. Dump it into the container located over the fire pit of the purifier and you should see a fire light itself once the planks are placed. The grill also requires a couple of planks. Place food in the hot bar and place it on the fire for cooking. Doing so increases the amount of hunger satiated when eating. The real only efficient way in the beginning to get around is by crafting a sail. It allows for speed and some amount of steering to at least point yourself in the direction of an island. We're still at the mercy of the wind though. Under the tab menu is a banner on a small stand that indicates the direction drafts are blowing called a streamer. But up until this point, there's really only a paddle available in the tool menu, which you may occasionally still need to dislodge yourself from islands. 
Essential first tools, other than replacement hooks, are the building hammer, fishing pole, and a wooden spear if playing on anything other than peaceful. The shark doesn't leave us alone for long. It's frequently trying to munch down on our raft, which requires repairs from the building hammer. This is also how you would add everything from raft floating foundations to walls and roof pieces. The fishing pole durability runs out pretty quickly, but it's easy to replace material-wise and is essential to staying away from starving. More tools will become available through the research table that are upgrades to the ones already mentioned, or even new stuff like a net launcher. After floating for a while, we were able to expand on the raft's surface area. The craftable nets, which can be mounted on the raft, were a huge aid in getting a lot of it done. But gotta watch for that pesky shark, or they're quickly gone. Keeping the purifier and campfire going in rotation can keep players alive, and we could just float forever. Except for it's not really possible to collect everything needed in the game, plus they'd, we'd miss out on most of the fun, so... Since reaching a goal on expanding the size of the raft, we're waiting for the next big island to spawn. Now is as good a time as any to get in some fishing or research. Periodically, islands pop up on the horizon from small to quite large. As raft progresses into the story mode, there will be more sort of biomes of islands, but for now, all we get is the tropical format. Pull up a parking spot alongside one and drop an anchor for a while. This is where we can get all of the other varieties of offered foods in addition to those earthen resources. When playing in anything other than peaceful, keep in mind that the shark still wants to make life miserable, and depending upon the difficulty of mode chosen, players have approximately between 2 and 8 minutes between attacks to do some exploration. Noteworthy items scattered around the surface level are pineapples, watermelons, flowers, and two trees that bear foodstuffs, and if you're lucky, dirt. I've been having a heckin' time finding dirt anyway. On the larger islands, players are likely to encounter some of the very live and active critters, both hostile and friendly. The most common to spot in early game are the boars that will drop meat, leather, and a hogshead that can be worn as a mask. The llamas, goats, and cluckers will not attack, but they will wildly run away and require a net launcher to capture. Killing them directly doesn't seem to yield any loot, but housing them on your raft will allow for daily harvesting of wool, milk, and eggs with a combination of the right gathering tools available from research. Once exhausting all there is to farm from the above waterline, there's much more cleanup to do along the ocean floor. That's where you can find the bulk of the scrap metal pieces, pipes, or mufflers are just everywhere. I can't help but think that there was a lot of cars sacrificed for this raft environment. We seem to be in a world that only sort of survived climate change. For the religious and spiritual crowds, apparently God flooded Earth again. Maybe they were mad about something? I don't know. Humans come up with some pretty creative explanations for why things flood. But maybe we'll find out more in the story. Although I can't say that I am any exception, why might be my favorite question of all. Humans are programmed to put patterns together. It's the basis for our intelligence to connect dots and understand their relations. Sometimes we get a little too carried away with connecting those dots to everything happens for a reason, even if the world is full of randomness. Climate change though, science consensus, that's not exactly random. This game does make me consider little of what the world might be like under extreme climate circumstances. Can you imagine the madness of almost being forever stuck floating on a giant raft? You can live it through this game and the somewhat hectic madness it feels like with the persistent activity, shark management between farming seaweed or some kind of metal. The seaweed can be found amongst the very tall plants, and it takes finding the sweet spot just above the middle of the plant to get within range to grab it. The silver algae plants are much smaller and harder to spot amongst the other plant life. Clay and sand piles are scattered all over the place, along with the scrap mufflers. It's not too hard to locate all of this stuff, but also look for the giant clams that are needed for the construction of bird nests. Stones are common, and they look like little bumps dotted along the sand. If you look closer, they might be shiny, in which case it's metal or copper ore that's much needed to start advancing the storyline. 
A lot of it can be found in large cliff sides in the deeper water. Just requires a lot of going up for air, but it's well worth the trouble. Because we can take that metal to the research table. It can also then be crafted into bolts and hinges for even more upgrades. This is going to get you a ton of tool upgrades, the very important size up in the storage containers, and a large crop plot. In order to make these ores, we're going to need a furnace first. That's what the clay and sand come in for. Those are for wet bricks, and after being placed on the deck to dry for a while, will be a dry brick, of which six are needed to craft the furnace. When loaded with planks, metal ore, it turns to ingot in under a minute, so you can rotate through materials including sand for glass and seaweed for the vine goo. The copper ingots, when researched, open up some of the more advanced crafted inventions. Circuit boards and batteries are going to get us into the story mode and eventually into a more automated raft life. We still have a ton to do though, building an adequate homestead on this little ship. There's yet to be any livestock on this deck. Ah! For regular food production, we have three size option makeshift planters called crop plots. The small crop lot can grow flower seeds that can be found on most if not all the islands along with other fruit seeds. For the ground grown fruit like pineapples and watermelons, we use the medium sized crop box. The larger ones will accommodate the trees. Pretty standard, plant a tree in water. No need to water repeatedly, just wait for the harvest to come around. But if you're playing on anything other than a peaceful mode, it means that plants need bodyguards from seagulls. The birds will periodically attack plants, but it does give players the opportunity to kill the bird by hitting it with a spear or arrow, leaving behind a couple drumsticks and feathers. These are much more manageable than the giant rock-throwing birds on the larger islands. And while these crops will provide a steady source for snacks, they'll become important in making a supply of biofuel in the future. It's good to leave extra room for more crop pots if possible. Flowers can be milled into paint, but also play a vital role in keeping bees fed. The small crop plot shapeshifts into a window box or a hanging planter when hovered against a wall or ceiling, so the flower crops can also be decorations. In order to accomplish creating a proper farm that can produce eggs, milk, and wool, the net launcher and explosive canisters are needed. The explosive canisters require a powder that starts with farming a few of the puffer fish. It's good to have an enclosure already made because your animals can go wandering right off the side of the raft. To feed them, it takes construction of the grass crop lots, which can be a little difficult if you haven't already located much dirt. The shovel comes along with upgrades obtained by researching for bolts to dig up the dirt and can usually be found in caves on the surface of large islands. Placing the grass crop lots into animal pens and keeping them watered will keep the critters fed. This way, they'll produce items. So far, in my experimentation with the net washer, it hasn't gone too well. But I have no idea how to aim this thing. And it's a good thing that Trustworthy does and has no trouble filling the raft on our multiplayer server with livestock. Getting some wool off the llama makes the backpack upgrade possible for an extra 10 spaces to fill before having to return to the raft. And this is a lifesaver upgrade! Goat's milk is used in cooking recipes made out of the cook pot, but you can also consume it straight. The cluckers provide eggs, which can be made into a salad for healing in addition to several cooked dishes. Not only are they a cute floating farm, they produce items as long as the grass crop plots are watered. A sprinkler could uh, be useful in alleviating that headache. While Trustworthy is busy, I've spent a little time in creative mode checking out what's possible and getting ideas for what to do with our primary raft in the survival gameplay, so it doesn't have to be remodeled repeatedly. Here, everything's unlocked and freely craftable with no materials since you won't find any materials around. The sidebar menu looks approximately the same as the regular modes, aside from one extra button labeled dot dot dot. 
For miscellaneous items in the game that would normally involve gathering, this includes your seeds if you want to have some decorative farms. Given the game has scrap mechanic elements, I wanted to test out the inventions provided and see how they might connect together. Nowhere near as elaborate, but still a fun aspect to raft building that will add functionality in huge ways. Quality of life is going to go way up with the automatically filtered water and engines. Interconnecting pipes makes automatic watering systems possible when combined with the battery-powered sprinklers. Pretty good stuff. And using the hammer highlighted in the action bar, right-clicking will bring up a menu of all of the assets for putting together structures from floor to roof, including pillars and fencing. After selecting the desired piece, hover around the approximate position for placing it, and note that the texture of the siding if you're particular about how that look comes out. Left-click to place, and poof, there it is! Besides the obvious red highlights to deny us from overlapping objects, Another building rule of the game is ensuring all foundations are supported by either a wall or pillar. I'll be doing a future video on building more in depth in this game. If you might be interested, consider subbing for that in future wrap content with Trustworthy and I. I've found that there's a fascinating storyline happening in this game. Way more so than I originally thought. I don't often get into game lore and even quickly click through NPC dialogue without reading it, unless the game has caught my attention. And it's happened. Imagine for a moment that you wake up on four slabs of wood attached to floating plastic. What on this earth could be the explanation for this situation? Have you A. Just survived a plane crash over the ocean, B. Been shipwrecked, or C. Survive the flooding of the planet. The game's bright and beautiful colors convey one thing, but the story mode starts to take a turn for the dark, and on the upcoming Raft playlist, there will be some guides on the storyline environments because we've already gotten through all of the current release Chapter 2. Developers are already teasing for Chapter 3, and the invention coming with it. I'm looking forward to it more than ever after collecting the final note for our journal. You can find this book by hitting the T key, flipping open to view the very little information that you can collect from the world that exists off your floating device. Construction of the receiver and three antennas will allow you to fire up a radar that will assist you in locating the radio tower using the coordinates in the journal. It's this first stop in the chain of understanding what's happened, and the writing is on the wall. Literally. It looks like someone's losing it, or lost it, or obviously left this place because we're alone now. Or at least we have Bruce's company to find the notes, blueprints, and the loot that's scattered around story locations. While not all notes are required, the final one in each place will be, or you won't have the next set of coordinates. Each location has inventions that will greatly improve your watercraft and usually involves heavy exploration that will require packing around extra cooked pot food and water bottles. The quest zones seemingly keep getting increasingly bigger, but also gains the addition of two new large island biomes that can spawn, evergreen and desert, to really expand on the game. With these two new options comes the introduction of two new tree species, more fruit, and bees! So if you're wondering how to finish that list in the research table, it's getting to the end of Chapter 1 and Balboa Island. I don't want to spoil the story for people who are into unfolding plots on their own, and I think this is a pretty good plot that's developing here. It's pieced together with clues from scrounged up notes, and it's a mystery that's beginning to match the scenery of all the abandoned structures getting ever increasingly creepier with every step. The rat-like mutated lurkers can be found in several locations to give you a bit of a jump scare. A miner's headlight is required for some locations to see anything if that's an indicator to how survival horror the game occasionally gets when you're looking for quest items. Keep setting sail to find humans, or at least find out what happened to them. Quite an amazing game, Raft is. One of the only critical reviews I ever came across about the game was a player who apparently missed altogether that there was a story going on at all. 
All they experienced was the survival grind, but with no real explanation or purpose. Now personally, I could probably still enjoy that much as long as the island biomes were added to, but understandable why some players have higher expectations even if they got the game for free or under 20 bucks. This title was originally a project of college students in 2016 and has been built upon until making it into the thing it is today from the free version hosted on Ichio, dating back to the initial project. It's been downloaded over 7 million times and when the game launched on Steam it sold over 400,000 copies in just the first two weeks, despite being done by an unknown indie studio. The story that's developed just makes the whole thing better and gives players something to connect to in their own story play. I definitely like where they're going with it, only just really eager to get to the next chapter to find out the who, what, when, where, and why, but it's also a small team, so reasonably updates do take a bit. However, they're worth the wait. I love the game, Red Bee. You're awesome! Thanks for giving us something so fun to play. It's better with multiplayer, but I have spent a, quite a bit of time solo on a peaceful server just for the heck of it too. It doesn't force overwhelming oneself with different modes available from peaceful to hard. There's also mods available for customizing gameplay if you google for those. I'll get to introducing some of the ones that we played with on the playlist I'm making. This title has been eating up a lot of our spare game time lately. Gladly, because it's been a joy to play through so far and I'm looking forward to seeing what explains the situation and what's going on with this story. I could go on and on and on about how cool the game is, but you can evaluate it for yourself if you haven't been already. Hopefully this video has been helpful in getting you started, and that you'll stick around for some more rafting with Tress Ruby and I. We're building a city on the water! Take care all! Bye bye!